Hi everyone, it's Susanna with Hypnosis Haven, and today I'd like to discuss the terms of emotional and physical, which are the terms that we use in Capucinian hypnosis to describe suggestibility type as well as sexuality. And this has nothing to do with any of the terms that are going on now about sexuality and identification. This has to do with the way that we behave, the way we react and respond to the world. So with that in mind, know that this has to do with Dr. Kappus's theory and it is on a scale. No one is 100% anything. We have a dominant type and then we have a subdominant type. So when we are in a good environment and we're able to be congruent, we'll be on that dominant side of the spectrum for this scale. When we're not and we are in a situation or a relationship with someone that has a higher number on that scale, it can be that the individual is going to be working from their subdominance levels. So if somebody tests as a 60% emotional on their sexuality and they are with somebody that is a 75%, then that person who has the lower score can then be working with their 40% of physical suggestibility, I'm sorry, sexuality. So the term suggestibility, as you might know already, has to do with the way we receive information, the way you learn. So this is something that is established during the first eight to nine years of life. This comes from the primary caregiver, and this is typically the mother, although not always the situation. When the person directly says, I love you, and it's clear, and it is congruent with the actions, and the child feels love, hears the word love, an association of love, which is clear, is established. Those children grow up typically to be physicals. When children grow up in an environment where they have a caregiver that says, I love you, but the child doesn't necessarily feel it because of the actions or the environment or things that are going on around the house, then that child is looking for the meaning of the words because it is not congruent. So that is where you end up with emotional suggestibility type and physical. For children that grow up in an inconsistent one, where it's sometimes like this and sometimes like that, those children can grow up to become synambulists. And synambulism is a topic for another video, another day. On this video, I want to discuss both the sexuality and the suggestibility, so that way you understand not just yourself, but people around you. And it helps in relationships that are romantic, family unit relationships, and work relationships as well. So let's get started. Emotional suggestibles. These are people, like I mentioned, that tend to take in information inferred. inferred. They're looking for the hidden meaning of things. So when they're in hypnosis, they, are, they respond best to suggestions that are indirect. So they respond to metaphors, they would respond to, like, I had a client who hadn't walked in years, and I shared with her the story of Milton Erickson, who was actually one of the pioneers of hypnosis. And he had suffered a debilitating illness that caused him to lose his ability to walk as well. But by watching a child learn how to go from crawling to walking, he re-stimulated the brain and was able to once again walk himself. So this client went from two years of not walking to walking once again. And that was a very big deal. But it was a combination of a lot of hypnosis sessions and I would say two dozen sessions. But this was also a combination. Like I said, it was physical and emotional instructions and suggestions that were given. So that is an example of how suggestion would work for an emotional suggestible. For a physical suggestible, they respond to direct suggestions. They need to be told directly, you will stop, stop smoking, you will stop snacking on these things, you will stop calling your ex, you will start exercising more. They respond to direct suggestions and it's clear. There's no search for a hidden meaning. It's fine to them. So that's the suggestibility, the way we receive information. 
for the most part now, the dynamic of the differences between the E and the P, uh, I'll use that for abbreviations, is the thought process. Now, for an emotional, it's the thought first, then it's the image, then it becomes an emotional feeling, and then a physical response. For the phys, it's the thought, the image, a physical feeling and an emotional response. For an emotional, love is conditional. For a physical, love is unconditional. When they speak, it's really interesting and fascinating. Since the emotional takes in information in an inferred way, they respond really well to the way a physical speaks. A physical is the type of person that will give you all the details about their vacation. If you ask them how their weekend was, they're going to start at 5 p.m. on Friday, what happened and what happened every moment of the weekend. If you ask an emotional how their weekend was, they'll usually sum it up in a word or two, if they even talk to you about their weekend. Here's the thing about emotionals and physics also. Emotionals, they don't tend to have a lot of friends. They have acquaintances from work. Physicals have large group friends. These are the people that tend to travel in groups and flocks, and it's just a lifelong group of friends. They are always more social. But this is more than social, antisocial, introvert, extrovert, because this is something that can be measured. It is something that can be observed and as a physical, you can know how to interact with your emotional. As an emotional, you can understand yourself and not be so hard on yourself because you might have noticed over time that there can be some challenges in the dynamics of relationships. And that's because we have opposite concerns. For an emotional, the primary concern is financial security and stability, career. That's number one. Next is hobbies. They care about their hobbies and their interests, then relationships and family. And the fourth one is sex lovers. And if they are capable of romance, romance. For a physical, a physical, their, their concerns are the opposite. Their number one is sex and relationships, romance. Because for them, when they were kids, that love that they were given that congruent love because children are looking for survival that's they're on survival they are learning how to survive in their environment and love is a big part of it so love is a big thing for physicals love physical touch affection those things are a form of acceptance a form of love so if you take away even a little bit of affection to a fizz after you have given them a lot of affection it begins to be interpreted as a sign or a form of rejection. Their next concern is family. Family, children, and then friends and hobbies. And then the fourth one, career and security. I guess because they had that security as a child in understanding the congruency of love is love, and so they are safe, they are loved, they are provided and protected for. With the emotional, because there was that inconsistency, now they're going to have consistency and security and assurance in a way that can be helped, and that's typically through the career. The next thing, I don't know if I've completed that thought, but a fizz, they will speak in a roundabout way, and they receive information directly, as I mentioned for the suggestibility type. It's the same thing when they're having conversations. So an emotional is the opposite. An emotional speaks clear, direct, precise, to the point. They had a weekend that was fine, it was good, it was nice, but they take in information in a roundabout way. So when the fizz is talking, talking, and going on and on about these things that they're trying to get their point across, whether it's your teenage child telling you about school and you have an emotional mother who is trying to decipher what the daughter is saying, that's the dynamic, it works. So when you have that type of understanding, then you can understand why you are the way you are and why the other people in your family dynamic are the way they are. Typically, children are physical from zero to nine. Everything is literal. They believe what they are told, they accept everything, and that is it for them. They hear it, they live it, they feel it, they absorb that into their subconscious memory. 
so does the emotional. But what they're going to do with it later, once they start to develop that critical and analytical mind around the age of 8, 9, 10, usually around 9 or 10, that's when they start doubting the things that they're told and they're able to put the ideas together to start questioning their reality and not so easily accept what they're told. So when that happens, they will usually go to what the secondary caregiver's sexuality type is. So their suggestibility type is formed, but now comes the way that they're going to put all of that information into practice in the world. So from the ages of about 9 to 14, 16, it's tough to tell because this, you know, kids, they develop so quickly these days. But right around those early adolescent years, that's when they're forming their sexuality type, meaning their way of behaving in the world. So they're going to be either emotional or physical in their types, okay? This has nothing to do with sex. This is meant in the way of the way you project yourself to the world, either as an emotional or a physical. An emotional, aside from being more subdued in their behaviors and things that might be interpreted as being more introvert, they tend to be subdued in the way that they dress. They tend to have social anxiety. They like to be given a lot of time in advance for events not great fans of last minute invitations and things because they need time to cancel. They might show up to things, you know, but for the most part, they, in their mind, will think of all the reasons why they can't go or they need to prepare themselves to go if it's something that they really need to go and do. They don't give a lot of compliments. They don't need compliments because it creates this whole series of questions of what does that mean? Whereas a fizz, they love compliments, they want compliments, they can become best friends with somebody over a compliment on their shoes. This is something that is a very clear difference between the two. For an emotional, they show love by being here. I'm here, aren't I? And for a fizz, they ask, do you love me? Do you still like me? Do you still want me? They need that constant affirmation of love and acceptance. For an emotional, well, they're here. I'm here. So obviously I love you, right? Now, this is where it can get a little bit dicey and uh, sensitive of a subject for some people. For an emotional, sex is sex. And for a fizz, sex is love. So when there's dating, when there's courtship, an emotional has a set day. And this is, I guess, a video for another day where we can discuss the cycle. But to be succinct and get to the point, imagining a three-day cycle. Day one, they are focused on work. They're not interested in anything else. Day two, that's when they're more interested, okay, in hobbies and they can loosen their mental grip on work and that career, financial stability and security that is their main focus. On the second day or the middle days of their cycle, once it's given some time, then they start to focus on their hobbies, their pastimes, the things that are of other interest to them. So if they're dating, if they're looking for a partner, this is where that's going to come into play. So on the third day, that's when they're fizzed out and they come forward. They come out and now they're looking for a partner. So their behavior is going to be like that of a fizz. So a fizz, and remember, they're on a scale. So that scale is going to determine just how fizz they're going to be based on how emotional they are. When they come out, they're going to attract a partner that is most likely a physical because that physical is going to be attracted to the person that is not necessarily hitting on them so much. That one that's different, the one that is, you know, so mysterious because everybody else is so drawn to the fizz. Why isn't that one drawn to me? And so they go forward and then a courtship begins. So assuming that it goes well and now they've settled into a nice routine. Once the emotional feels comfortable with this person, then they will allow physical touch. They will allow for that to happen. And then that is when the physical begins to become even more attached. So 
now that the emotional has found their partner, they found the person that they want to be within a relationship with, now they retreat back into their internal mental world. Now keep in mind that they only go out on the days that they are fizzing out. So when they become comfortable and they don't need to go out anymore, now they're just going to be as they are in their emotional world and way of being. That's when the physical begins to think that they've changed. What happened? Why are you acting this way? You're not like this. Do you still love me? Do you still want to be with me? And so it creates this this spiral it can it can go out of hand depending on the fizz and how they are in their mental and emotional development of course so when this happens the physical begins to feel physical hurt over this perceived rejection so they push and they push and they go forward and forward because they are fearing rejection that is their number one fear rejection the number one fear for an emotional is the loss of control. So here they are in their world, and here's this physical banging on the door, trying to get into their world, and the emotional is saying, I haven't changed, this is who I am because this is who they are. But the physical can't understand that because sex is love and sex is sex. You have two different perspectives on a very intimate thing. So the physical tries and tries to come forward more and the emotional begins to detach even if it's just mentally and they're still physically there. So they go through the cycles of, okay, trying to appease the fizz, but in their mind they've left. And that is unfortunate, but they will be the first ones to quit because it's too draining. Because this emotional feeling and that physical response, it's just too much for them. Because remember, they like control. And their priority is what it is. And it's the opposite of the physics priority. For them, it's a physical feeling and an emotional response. They are physically feeling rejected. And now they're emotionally a wreck. So it really helps to know these things. But I mean, who teaches us this unless... You go to HMI and learn this because I'll tell you, when we were in class learning this theory, everybody's light bulbs just went like, wow, I wish I had knew this when I was in high school. Would have helped. Could have been great tips to know. So this is some information about the E and the P. There is more to it. Um, I'm looking over my notes and I can tell you some of the ways to tell on um, if you're emotional and a physical, or how you respond to breakups, how you respond to the rejection. Do you feel the rejection or are you the one who is creating that rejection? When you have, you know, your relationship to the body, that's the other thing. The physicals, they are very connected to their experience, to the reaction. They experience it in their body immediately. An emo will have a delayed reaction. Emotionals, think about things first before they feel it. So it's an emotional feeling before they get a physical response. And that's in a lot of things. So that is an explanation on the theory of E and P. That is something that I hope helps you understand more about some of the things that I might have mentioned in the previous videos and the videos to come as well. Um, if you have any questions about it, I know I'm making this video to help explain another video about inductions and about how there's a difference in inductions. And I'll make another one on synambulists as well. Uh, that one is a bit shorter, but that one has more to do with the upbringing and how an inconsistent environment can create that type of suggestibility. So thanks again for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Remember to click on subscribe so you can get notices and reminders for when I release a new video. And if you have any questions, you can visit my website, hypnosis-haven.com. And on that website, you can fill out, there's a contact form if you want to schedule a free consultation. And you can also send me an email. There's a link almost on every page so that if you have any questions about hypnosis, the process, any differences in it, you can send me an email and I'd be happy to answer that for you as well. 
So thanks again for watching. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.